Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. It is a webinar um, where we cover a variety of topics um, of interest to the library world. Uh, the show is free and open to anyone to watch both our live show, which we're doing right now, and our recordings, which are available on our website. Um, after, if you're not able to join us on Wednesday mornings, you can always uh, go to our website and see all of our archives there. Uh, and watch everything from there. We do um, the show live on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Central Time. And they last generally an hour, sometimes long, sometimes short, whatever it takes. Um, we're very flexible here. Um, and it's a mixture of things, presentations, interviews, book reviews, mini training sessions. Um, as I said, anything library related, we um, want to have it on the show and share it. Um, and this week's topic, well, this week is our monthly Tech Talk with Michael Sowers. Michael is our Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Good morning. And once a month he comes on and does something a little more more techy focused, generally speaking, um, and gives us some tech news of the month, whatever's come up that's interesting since the last time we were here. Um, and sometime, and generally pretty much every time he brings on um, speakers, yeah, more often than interviews, not, yeah. talks, whatever. And he's got a group on the line with us today, and I'm just going to hand over to you, Michael, to tell us who you've got with All us right. and um, what we're going to hear today. All right. Thanks, Krista. Uh, as she said, my name is Michael Sowers. I'm the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Commission. And um, kind of the, the story behind our guests this um, month is a few months ago, I think I saw a, a tweet or something that just kind of went, went past my, my radar that, that had this word Mozillarian uh, and kind of a combination of librarian and the, and the folks at uh, Mozilla that uh, make a browser you may be aware of. And so that was from a, a woman by the name of Christine. And so I texted her and I said, you know, hey, this sounds really interesting. Would you like to come on the show and talk about it? She said, sure. And can I bring along some folks? So today, I, I love this. We have a truly international panel going on uh, uh, today. Uh, our, our first uh, speaker will be Christine Prefontaine. She's in Canada. Uh, she is the strategist, activist, innovator, and designer, and she's the founder of Facilitating Change, a boutique, a boutique consultancy focusing on international nonprofit and community development. Uh, our second guest will be Chris Lawrence of the Mozilla Foundation here in the United States, and I must say the man with the most epic headshot uh, photo I have ever seen in my life. Uh, he is a senior director of Mozilla's webmaker community team. And then uh, our third speaker will be O.K. Nigren, I think I got that right, uh, from the Stockholm Public Library in Sweden, and he has been active in various library projects with a focus on lifelong learning, learning environments, digital inclusion, and social media. So uh, that's our panel. I'll let them uh, each talk a little bit more about uh, themselves and what they do and what this project is. And uh, Christine, uh, go ahead and uh, welcome to the show and take it away. Great. Thank you. And thanks for inviting us on. And thanks to everyone for taking the time to join us. So again, um, my name is Christine Prefontaine, and just to confuse you, I'm actually a Quebecer from Quebec, and I'm currently living in Washington, D.C., so I'm going to mix up the international bit a little bit more. Um, so I uh, want to assure you that just like it says in this picture, which is from the um, Chattanooga Public Library, that you are indeed in the right place. So you're online now with others who I'm pretty sure want to connect and help each other learn and dream and create and achieve. And I'm guessing that um, most of you understand that both libraries and the internet are about human potential and essential infrastructure. And that both of those are very, very much in need of our attention and our action. So this lovely diagram here is from my friend um, Mark Sermon, who um, heads up the Mozilla Foundation. And it, it really sort of covers some of the key points that I think um, cover that intersection between Mozilla and libraries. So I'm just going to run through um, a few other introductory images and slides just to kind of set the tone. Uh, before I pass things on to Chris. So um, this just also gets at, this is um, the Princeton Public Library. 
after Sandy hit. And when I say that libraries and the internet are critical infrastructure, this is a really good example of what I mean. These people are accessing power, uh, connecting to government services, connecting to each other, and this would not happen without open libraries, free and open libraries, and a free and open internet. So through an initiative called Beyond Access, which I've um, had the pleasure to work on, I've met library innovators from 20 plus countries. And by getting involved with Mozilla, I've met super insanely creative activists and educators and discovered practical tools and fun ideas for um, how to uh, learn and how to teach others to make in both the physical and the digital world. Uh, this image here is from the Fayetteville Free Library in New York. And, um, you know, kids are learning to make and they're learning about electronics in their, uh, the Fayetteville Free Library fab lab um, that was uh, initially set up by Lauren Britton, who actually I think has been on this show. So, and this image here is, um, is one I always I keep coming back to because it's um, from the Skokie Public Library. And it's a session where um, people are learning how to use mobile phones. So um, these are just like some of the really broad range of things that libraries do in tech. So basically, both libraries and Mozilla help us to realize our potential and gain 21st century skills, which allows us to engage fully in our communities and to be empowered as citizens. And just a few more images. So this is um, this is actually from uh, a project that Chris can talk uh, to you more about, which is um, from Hive New York, and it's uh, um, a maker party using Mozilla's Popcorn Maker, which um, allows you to play around with video and create with video, and it's at the Brooklyn Public Library. So again, Mozilla celebrates this intersection. Today we're here to learn more about Mozilla and to highlight some examples of librarians who are using Mozilla tools and ideas in their work. And um, so I just want to just show you some quick uh, examples of, um, this is more uh, Hive New York, Brooklyn. And here is um, one of these, or I've, she might not call herself a Mozillarian yet, but I'm going to call her one. This is from Melissa Techman, who um, is uh, actually a K through grade. She's a school librarian now, but she was a public librarian. And she's using WebMaker to do some um, programming with her kids that combine um, books and learning about tech. And likewise, uh, this was uh, back to Chattanooga. This is Justin Henke at the Chattanooga Public Library. And he has created an entire kit um, using WebMaker. And that will um, you know, lead um, students or participants through a whole series of um, super fun activities that will help them to create and learn with, with the web. So, Basically, now I'd like to turn the webinar over to Chris, um, who um, has already been introduced to you. And then after that, we'll hear from OK, who um, is uh, the, really the driving force behind Mozillarian. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Um, let me just bear with me um, while I share my screen here. Do you all see a blue screen that says Mozilla WebMaker? Can someone confirm? I don't yet. Ah. Uh, how about now? Yep, go ahead. Are you able to see my screen? Okay, yep, great. Sorry. Thank you. I had, I had um, myself muted. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Um, hello, my name is Chris Lawrence, and um, thanks very much for the introductions. Um, I am. I work for the Mozilla Foundation, and I um, really am working on on two projects that are about outreach and networking and community building around the intersection of learning, 
um, the web and, and digital skills. And that is the WebMaker community, which I'm going to talk about the WebMaker tools and community um, here for you. And then also the Hive Learning Network, which um, you know is similar and they, they really do sort of draft off each other to a good amount. Um, but they do have some distinct differences, and, and we run both those projects. Um, I want to quickly um, follow up and do a little bit of a deep dive, not too deep, on what we're referencing when we talk about Mozilla's WebMaker tools and the tools of community around what it's like to, to really dive in and look at learning um, in all kinds of spaces. So um, museums, after-school programs, youth development and, and youth media clubs, and of course libraries. Um, and so our work with the Hive Learning Network really takes those kind of spaces and brings network thinking to their practice. And WebMaker is also working with those same audiences, often in tandem. But we really view libraries as maybe one of the key spaces and professionals and people and community that we want to work with. So it's, a gr it's really exciting to be able to, to talk further about that here. Um, so I'm actually going to use the WebMaker tool Thimble um, that I created this presentation with. So it looks like Prezi. I'll give you, you know, everyone knows Prezi, and it sort of looks like that. But it's actually using the WebMaker tool Thimble, um, which puts a lot more power into the hands of the user as they up-level their web literacy. And I'm going to unpack that here for you now. Um, so most of you probably know Mozilla. If I was, if we were on the same room, I'd raise your hands and say, you know, who knows Firefox? And, and, but Mozilla is really a lot more than just Firefox, including an, a whole nonprofit wing that really is looking at how the open web and around the web as a platform for learning, for activism, for, for data collection, for, for journalism looks like in our, in our modern world. Um, so WebMaker really is the brand, the tools, the community, and the ideas behind what links what Mozilla is doing with teaching and learning. Um, with this idea that the web is a, is a malleable, it's, it's a creative platform, it's something that we can all control, we can make with. Um, it is like paint or thread or electronic hardware. It is, it is a creative space. And so when we talk about making the web or teaching the web, our web literacy, we aren't just talking about the sort of make made to code movement. We support that movement. We think it's important. There's people like code.org and others who are doing um, really amazing work in advocating for, for code literacy and building programs that support that. And we, we certainly support that as well. But we also think that about web literacy and about the web maker work has to be much broader. It is really about how people understand, how they read, how they write how they interact, how they become citizens of the web. And so when we really think about our work here, we really like it in this way. So culture and mechanics, and then thus the citizenship of the web um, is where the, really what we're trying to get after with, with learning and web and the web. Um, so one of our pithy sayings there. Um, and so that is, there is code in there, and then one of the things that we think is important with WebMaker is it does start to peel back the layers of mystery about the web so that it really be, can become an amateur creative space for people. You can exhibit your creativity on the web just knowing a little bit of HTML and a little bit of CSS, and we hope that the WebMaker tools not only allow you to start making the web, but also start to understand some of the web's components. Um, I'm going... So we have three key tools. Um, Mozilla's Thimble, which is actually what I used to build this presentation, um, our X-ray goggles, and what's something we call Popcorn Maker. And they're all free and open. They're all available to use anywhere, anytime, by anybody. Um, the only thing you have to do is create a quick account on, on WebMaker, and you can publish, you can create, you can remix, and you can share other people's work. And quickly, Thimble is a, is a code-based editor. In fact, I will show you. Now you can see, you can actually get into the guts of my presentation. So if you notice on the left hand side is both instructions and the code, the HTML and the CSS and a little bit of JavaScript that actually go and make my presentation. And I'm not going to do it now because I don't want to mess up my, um, my presentation in flight, so to speak. But anything that I make a, a change on the left hand side will automatically happen in a visual form on the right. So you can actually be designing and coding um, side by side. So that's, that's Thimble. 
We also have something we call X-ray goggles, um, which actually I will activate. You notice at the top where my cursor is, there's a little um, there's a little browser applet um, that allows me when I click that, it actually turns my cursor into a web X-ray goggles. It allows you when you when you mouse over something to actually see what the code is behind it um, and actually start to see what are the different elements. Um, and you can actually, um, you can hit certain buttons, ah, I did the wrong thing, um, where you can actually go in and change those aspects. So I won't go into too much detail here. Um, let me catch back up. So that allows you to kind of quickly look under the hood and actually change and publish. They sort of make mock-ups. It's a great um, for people to sort of, sort of see what is underneath the web page and then have some fun to be creative. Enough, we believe that no learning happens unless you're bringing your, your interests, your passions, and, doing, and, and mixing in that learning with that creative drive. The third tool is Popcorn Maker. And this is an open video editing platform that allows you to actually bring web, the web into video so you can actually make video that when it's watched it's actually doing live callouts to, to different web assets so you, um, it's using APIs it's using um, it's using unique data that's being pulled in it essentially makes any video that's made with popcorn maker never the same twice because it's always finding that dynamic call out data from the web that's then embedded into the video um, and so back to the culture piece and you know, that was a little look at the mechanics the culture piece is really about what what kind of freedom do we want in, in a in a web driven world, and we really are about how do you move people from production from consumption. There's a real danger of the web seeming like it's a black box, seeming like it's locked down, and there actually are you know political forces or policy forces or uh, private company forces that would actually like us to think about the web in that construct. Um, so it's important to not only know that it is actually a changeable platform and remixable and customizable, but also to understand why it's essential to keep that and to push back on that. And so the Douglas Rushkoff sort of um, saying the program or be programmed is really part of what we connected with here. Um, I kind of skipped ahead there. I'm going to actually jump over really quick to show you a new highlight that we've got in our webmaker, and that's webmaker.org if you're following along at home. Um, but we just launched this two weeks ago, so we're sort of, we haven't done a lot of outreach to this, so you're one of the first communities that um, I've had the chance to actually walk through. Um, and it really is about our work in web literacy. And so over the last about year and a half, with a broad global community, we've put together what it would be, what would be the competencies and skills to be web literate in the world, understanding that those are the kind of frameworks and um, a literacy agenda that is really going to make our work and learning resonate and give it grounding. Um, so, so we call this the web literacy map. Um, you can see here on the screen, it's sort of broken up into three categories, exploring, building, and connecting. And then there's, uh, there are different competencies um, for each of those sections, and then within that, individual skills that would help um, learners understand those different competencies. And we just launched this new feature, which is we really wanted to align our content um, and the, the, the products that people are making with WebMaker tools or other tools out on the web, um, and make the web literacy map really a way to examine these ideas through content and experiences and learning by making. So um, I'll pick quickly, I'll just say composing for the web. So if you click on that, you actually come into this page, which gives you the individual skills a quick um, sort of bite-sized understanding of what that competency means, what that means to be web literate in, in, this, in this strand. And then it takes users and learners and hopefully teachers, um, educators writ large, through a process of discovery and exploration um, on that competency. So discover, um, make, so how do you kind of learn about or explore the concept? How do you actually use that in different production-based methods to deepen your understanding? Under, we really believe that when, when people learn and, and knowledge is transferred, that it's done through a production process. As well as then teach, and I'll talk about these teaching kits in just a second, but then there is curriculum packages 
um, that are both written by us, by others, by community, um, that highlight and empower people who want to do, do education to work with communities. And that's everything is light touch, is a couple people sitting around the table um, and discussing these things and playing and, and practicing together, to formal education and all of the spaces in between. Um, so that is, I'm going to back up so we can kind of see again at the big picture level. And if you notice, if you go up these web literacies, you can kind of get a quick navigation from there. But we understand, especially when it comes to places like libraries and librarians and the, the people that are using libraries, to have this literacy framework around why it's important to understand the, the culture, citizenship, and mechanics of the web would be a really, um, and love your feedback on this, strong context and frame for how people can start to up-level their skills, understand why these skills are important, and have a schema um, for understanding that more broadly. I'm going to actually skip ahead, Ed, because I'm, I want to definitely have questions and leave time for discussion. One of the ways that we're really starting to organize what I've talked about here is something I think is super exciting, and I'd love to see who in this virtual room um, would like to be a part of this. And it, um, and it really is a call out for community participation. And that's something called our Maker Party. Um, I'm going to go ahead and play this video really quick off my browser. If, if that's a bad idea, someone just sort of break in and stop me, um, and I'll it, talk for an additional 10 seconds. <laughs> Chris, it's, we, go can, ahead. we can give it a shot. Um, if you're on a headset, I know it will not work. Uh, otherwise, if you're on you know, open speakers and a microphone, just turn your speakers all the way up, and, and it should come through. Okay. I'm going to try that, and I'm not on a headset. Yeah, we're not getting sound. <laughs> okay, so there's a prompt to go ahead and watch that, um, and I'll give you the I'll give you the quick twenty second overview. It was basically a maker party that we did with the Brooklyn Public Library last summer during last summer's campaign, um, which wanted to take this intersection of the web, production based culture, participatory culture, education, public spaces, and do a maker party that made sense in a library. And so we actually called it Story Makers. And so all of the different activities from a bunch of different organizations um, had this kind of storytelling theme through even something like electronics or, or animation or storyboarding or, or uh, web maker tools um, or even different kinds of physical making. Um, and that really is the sort of desult of Maker Party. Maker Party is our annual campaign um, that, that maps to summer, although it's global, so it's not summer everywhere. Um, but it's, it's two months, this year July 15th to September 15th. And it really is a w way to get people to throw these maker parties that bring in others, bring in community, can be small, can be large scale, awesome when they're in libraries. Libraries is a perfect space for this. To come in, to, to flip open the computer, or to break out the, the makey makeys or the electronics, um, and start to see what it's like to create and produce together underneath this sort of global campaign of maker party. And last year we had um, I think we had 1,700 global events, many of them, many of them in libraries and associated with librarians. Um, and I'm not even remembering off the top of my head how many. Let's see if I go to history here. Um, no, they don't have the math anymore. Um, where they were, but they were all over the world. And I would love to say um, to this group, would love to see action coming out of this meeting, and I'm happy to work with all the folks that would like to, to, what it would be like to throw one of these maker parties in your library space. It could be very informal, setting up in, in, in a room or a hallway or a, a meeting space um, or out in a general rotunda, and, and what it would be like to, to have people experiment with the web maker tools, have other organizations bring in their, their learning programs and, and come together intergenerational, very informal, and experiment with this kind of production-based digital culture. Um, and with that, I don't want to hog much of the time, so I'm going to cede the mic there, although I'm happy to take questions now, later, or pass it off. Just let me um, yeah. can ask it. Okay, yeah, Chris, we got, we got a couple questions I think apply directly to you. Um, okay. The, the, the first one I'll throw in, can, can we uh, easily assume that the, the tools you've been showing us will work in multiple browsers, cross-platform, or should we really be using Firefox? <laughs> ah, that's a great question. So. 
You do not, so here I'll start it with a definitive. You do not have to use Firefox for these tools to work. They work in all browsers. Um, and they, they, they use open standards like all Mozilla tools, and so they should be cross-platform. Um, you really just need a browser um, and an internet connection um, for, for these tools to work. The one, the one I have heard some feedback and seen some bugs filed, um, technical bugs against uh, on the tools around some, some occurrences of strange behavior in Internet Explorer, but I've also seen it work on Internet Explorer many, many times. But Chrome, Opera, Safari, um, it works in all browsers. Okay, fair enough. Um, and then uh, we got a question from uh, Linda in uh, one of the uh, attendees, and, and I'm going to kind of manipulate her question just a little bit. You mentioned that the, the, the kind of this, the, not the standards, but the... the uh, the map, the web the, the map, the, yeah, the the things you should probably know. Map. You worked with libraries on that. Um, were thing, she she was specifically asking like there's ACRL standards. I know there's some some other standards around in the library world. Can can you speak to having referenced any of those or what sort of library involvement was there in creating those? It was individual librarians who were part of the. Uh, it was broad. It was teachers. It was technologists. It was Ed, uh, educators, it was librarians that were that came together and and wanted to build these um, build these competencies. And and we definitely we definitely looked at other standards that existed, and we we wanted to make these we well we didn't want these to be standards in the way, especially in North America, as we understand those standards to mean as map to you should know by X or you should uh, demonstrate Y by Z. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, we wanted these to be global in scope, and so though you know that sure. system of alignment break, you know, very quickly when you deal with with different government agencies and 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 standard bodies and and so forth, and so on and so forth. And we also wanted to stay away from these. We wanted these to be a little bit more organic and living, and people can contribute to this conversation. Um, and so we really kept it more in the literacies framework than the standards. And so it's definitely informed by those. But we did want to, in fact, they. I pushed hard. They were going to call it a standard for a while, more based on technology's understanding of, of open standards for platform use, sort of referencing the last question. Um, and then I really said this is going to cause confusion when it, it, it starts to interact with more formal education because of the way standards are used. And so we really wanted this to be more of a list and a description and a series of skills and competencies that, that would mean you are web literate. So we wanted they're intentionally agnostic to connecting to, to more formal standards. Um, and it's not a closed book. We, we locked this down until the fall just so that we could build these kind of platforms and tools on top of them. But we will be opening up this conversation about what it, what it means to expand these, to rethink these, um, to, to, to nest them in these sort of broader literacy movements um, or make better linkages to existing standards when that's relevant. So there will be kind of a phase two of that community involvement on how these web literacies grow and expand. And so look forward to doing more of that alignment in that next phase. All right. Yeah, sounds great. It's a, yeah, I like, as you phrased this, they're informed by, and yeah, sometimes just the the, the definite uh, the definition of terms being used needs to be clarified because coming from two different uh, uh, backgrounds, you might think of it one way versus another way. Um, so, okay, it seems that the, those are the questions we have immediately for Chris. So what we'll do at this point is, Chris, I'm going to mute you. And, okay, are you with us? Okay, are you there? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm there here. you go. Okay, I'm switching over to you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, Hello. we can see it. Great. Um, Okay, so, uh, like as uh, Christine said, in the introduction, I work in New Guinea and I work as a project leader for the digital library department at the Stockholm Public Library System. And I'm, I'm very thankful to be uh, have, having this invitation to be on the show. Thank you very much. Um, I, what I wanted to do now is just showcase the blog uh, called Mozillarian, mozillarian.org, and also give us uh, a short sneak preview of uh, a, um, 
<clears throat> what I call a Muslimian world map that I, I started building upon just the other day. Um, but first, some words about the blog. I can just get rid of the, that thing there. Right. So um, last autumn at the Mozilla Festival in London, uh, I was there uh, meeting uh, Christine P. Fontaine and, and, and some other people. And, and we came up with this idea of uh, doing some, something more structured towards uh, uh, bridge building between Mozilla uh, community and the, the library world. Um, and this, uh, this uh, word Mozillarian came out in my mind and I, I thought it would be a cool idea to set up a blog. First of all, as a way of uh, <coughs> learning myself and learning together with other people about what can be discovered in this intersection between these two worlds. There are already quite a lot of librarians active in the Mozilla community, but they are not always very visible in the library community, at least not in Europe and in Sweden. And the other way around, it's, uh, uh, there are lots of um, librarians who, who are not aware of all the possibilities that Mozilla can, can give in terms of uh, learning and teaching and, and, and all that. So anyway, uh, I put up the blog and, and ever since, uh, now for about six months, I've been blogging on, on this uh, platform and I've invited some, some people to uh, be co-bloggers and I'm, I would be really happy to have more people uh, coming on board and, and, and uh, because it's, uh, the idea is that this blog is, is, should be a collaborative, independent and experimental blog. Uh, so. Um, what is the idea behind, and what is all the, 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 the what is the Mozilla in all about? Let's go to a sub page that I just about twenty minutes before this show finished uh, the, the final version of this one. So it's uh, it's the first time I present the Mozilla in platform this way, which is exciting. Let's see what you think of it. So what's uh, Mozilla all about? Um, it's about exploring the intersection between Mozilla and the library world, as I have touched. Discover and share ideas and resources where these two worlds can be mixed together. And also be part of discussions about the shared values between libraries and the Mozilla community. At the Mozilla Festival, there was a guy from Brazil sharing a, a remix uh, about uh, the open web and the reason why he believes in the open web and the, the, his answer was it's the biggest public library you could ever build and I thought that uh, message and this uh, screenshot works very well as a frame as a way of uh, expressing what the Mozillarian uh, ethos could be all about. Uh, Mozillarian is also about boosting the concept of it of the internet as a world library, a public repository that libraries need to embrace, protect and develop. So it's not just something for us to uh, consume and watch, but also be a, an active part of and co-create and make things together with others to take this responsibility together with others for, for internet and, and have the mindset and look at it as what it is, uh, uh, the biggest public repository and we should join forces with Mozilla, I think, to protect it and develop it freely and make it uh, uh, possible for us to maintain the internet in the future as a free open platform. It's also about uh, the Mozillarian uh, thing, so to speak, is about supporting and developing the Mozillarian community. And what is the Mozillarian community? Well, the way I see it, it can be Mozilla-loving librarians, it could be library-loving Mozillians, and anyone really who's doing good things for the web and for libraries and who sees the internet as a world library, as I, as I said. Um, I have to ask you to actually come, uh, um, can you hear me all right? Yep, you're coming through loud and clear. Ah, good. I just I, I can't hear in anything, so I wasn't sure if I was even online. <laughs> yep, you're good. Okay, okay, I continue. Um, so the next uh, thing I wanted to highlight is uh, boosting a new librarianship for the 21st century. 
Um, David Lunk is, is a very good thinker, a librarian who's done a tr tremendous work is, uh, to build uh, a new sort of definition of what a, a, library of the f a librarian of the future can be. Um, and he says that the mission of librarians is to improve society through facilitating knowledge creation in their communities. And that fits extremely well into this, I think. Uh, I mean, the li librarian or the libra library co-worker as a facilitator, curator, community, ma community manager, and a civil rights activist. Um, I think the Mosellarian identity can be seen as um, the bridge building between librarianship, traditional librarianship, and geekship, so to speak, uh, uh, to, to bring these two uh, worlds together. And Mosellarian is also about attitude and passion. It's not really a title. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a partly for fun, a partly serious uh, word for, for me. Um, it's also about fomenting new literacies for the 21st century. Media and information literacy that has been adopted and fomented by UNESCO and EFLA and so on. And also uh, what uh, Mozilla uh, adds here is the concept of web, web literacy, which I find really interesting. Uh, we have a chance to introduce these, uh, the, the web literacy map, for example, into the, in the library world. Um, for those who are not familiar with it, and use it as a tool to structure our own work for digital inclusion in the libraries. It's also about advancing the concept of con connected learning in the library community, and connected learning is something that Chris definitely is the expert to, uh, to uh, he, he's the one to explain uh, what connected learning is, uh, but uh, the way so far, the way I see it is that we, from the library perspective, what we need to do is reach out to more to, to the community, uh, join forces together with other partners in society and in the community, um, and find, way, find ways of uh, 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 doing a, a better work together with, uh, for example, museums and youth centers, uh, etc., after school centers and so on. Um, discovering Mozilla tools, learning how to use them, teaching how to use them is also, of course, uh, very central here. Um, creating, remixing, translating teaching kits for the library community. So I feel that uh, what is exciting and what sort of the main driving force behind for me is that I can ha I have a chance here, I have a possibility here to actually learn by making something myself on a daily basis. So, so the way of learning is to actually reach out to the community and, and, and learn from others, create things, make things, um, teach, and be a co-teacher together with others. I think that's fascinating. So uh, I just quickly show this thread uh, on the WebMaker training page that was set up recently. Um, and, and there are, there's a discussion about uh, the possibility to actually make a similar uh, WebMaker training MOOC, but for librarians to adopt this, ad adapt, sorry, adapt this uh, to uh, the library context and, and, and reach out better and, and more effectively to librarians. Uh, hang on. Uh, yeah, and another example of. Um, okay, I, I, that was a bad link. Uh, it's. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just uh, uh, um, briefly. Give an introduction to uh, a, a make that I I made recently called Reset the Library because there, there was this uh, campaign Reset the Internet, um, and I uh, I'll just see if I can just Google it. We. Sorry. 
So what, what can I do to boost online privacy in my library community? Because uh, it's a it's a step by step teaching kit uh, aimed at librarians. In order to uh, make use of uh, some new very good apps that the Reset Net uh, uh, campaign has uh, introduced, um, and these apps can protect uh, our online presence, both on an individual level but also an institutional level. So I thought it was a good idea to do something to make it easier for us as library co-workers uh, and to, to learn how to protect ourselves from mass surveillance and from, from uh, bad uh, supervision and, and, and also to uh, teach others about how to protect themselves. So to sum up, uh, who is a Mozillarian in my point of view? Well, Mozillarian explores the intersection between the Mozilla community and the library world. Uh, the Mozillarian is a librarian by heart, but not necessarily by training. Mozillarian is a Mozillian by heart, but not necessarily by training. A, a webmaker, he or she creates knowledge and networks for communities. He or she sees at each moment and every context as a potential opportunity for co-creation, building and learning. Uh, Mozillarian remixes things and believes that sharing is the gateway to knowledge. So as I said in the beginning, this is just uh, the, the most recent version of, uh, of what Mozillarian is all about in my point of view. And it, of course it's a work in progress. So it, it can be uh, and will be changed step by step. Uh, uh, but, but I think I covered more, the most important parts of, of what, what lies behind it all. Let's have a quick look, a sneak preview on the Mozillarian world map. It's, uh, uh, the idea is to map uh, people who I uh, or we uh, could uh, call Mozillarian people. They can be librarians or they can be Mozillians, they can be anyone who really who shares these values. And, and uh, uh, so far, uh, it's not it's not open for the public, but it will be uh, soon. Uh, as soon as uh, people are mentioned in the on the map, uh, agree upon you know being 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 there, and, and that so that they can make uh, their own presentations. Um, it's also um, a way of mapping what libraries out there that are actually doing good stuff in the intersection between Mozilla and the library community. It's also um, a list of uh, examples of, of uh, maker parties and, and events uh, related to Mozilla that have been arranged uh, in libraries or in a library context, or will be. You can also, on this map, you can also find uh, the different Hive networks that Chris is uh, uh, in, uh, the expert. Well, he's the expert on this, but, but uh, the idea of uh, the map is to let people get uh, a first glimpse into this world, a first glimpse into these networks and find their ways. Uh, further. Uh, so let's say we, someone is interested in Hive New York, um, he or she can just click and, and discover more. If someone is interested in uh, what uh, Chattanooga Maker Party is all about, then he can he or she can find find more information there, etc. Um, oh yeah, there's also a list of uh, uh, cities that are, will belong to the initiative called Cities of Learning. And I think Chris can explain everything about that. Um, I think my time 
is running up. Uh, I don't, I, I'm not sure. What do you think, uh, Michael? All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Krista, you wanted to mention that the link's um, going on before yeah, we get to questions? Um, just so everyone knows, as usual, during um, Encompass Live, we grab any URLs, links, web pages that are mentioned, and um, be, before the show, I actually grabbed all the ones that were in the um, description of the event of this, so for the webmaker and Mozilla and whatnot. Um, so they're all be in our delicious account. So after the show, when you get the the link for the recording, um, you'll have a link to everything that's been mentioned. Um, we also got someone had shared the um, from that closet library that was it Christine's yes. presentation had the screenshot of. Um, someone sent us the link to the actual um, pages that they put together on using Thimble. So we'll have links to those as well. Okay. So try and grab everything so that you can um, get to it afterwards. Great. All right. Um, okay. At this point, we'll we'll stay with your screen sharing. So anything you do, we'll see. We're going to open it up to questions, and I've unmuted the microphones for all of our speakers because we may have some for everybody or some for for someone in particular. And I believe we have at least one question from the audience. We do, We'd yeah. like to prefer mm -hmm. those. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And if anyone does have any other questions, type them into your question section um, of your GoToWebinar interface, or say, "I have a microphone. I want to be unmuted, and we'll unmute you, and you can ask your question that way." And if any of our speakers, as part of answering a question, want control of the screen back, just let us know, and we'll, we'll switch that for yeah, you. Yeah, we so. can hand it back and forth. Um, someone wants to know if there's um, the capability to create a private maker party, um, specifically concentrated within a school library without the information broadcast out to the general public. This is something that's kind of common with schools, that they would keep stuff you know, internal and not for anyone to come in with all, where all the you know, elementary students are. So, private maker party? Uh, for sure, that that's totally um, that's totally acceptable. Um, I know if you go to our, um, I'm not going to bother getting the screen back, but I mean we, the the answer is a resounding explanation point. Yes. Um, <laughs> the one caveat would be uh, is that we do have an events platform, which is you know where people use to kind of organize their events and list them and put them on the map. You can say that it's – I would still hope that people would list their events so that they can be part of that aggregate counting and celebration that these events took place and so that we can have these individual events be connected and linked to kind of a global campaign, um, although you can say this isn't a closed event within that listing. So I would still love it if there's a closed event in a school or a library or if there's a set amount of seats available and they're already filled, what have you, mm -hmm. that people could still go ahead and go to webmaker.org um, and, and click on events and still register their events there so that we just get a sense of what's going on. And then short of that, if that feels uncomfortable, we'd be happy to, to get you know details about your event or even a report back um, to, to, to my email address, C. Lawrence at mozillafoundation.org just so we could know, right? So it's about it's about linking and connecting this movement as, as much as it is about the individual event. So that's my only slight caveat, but yes, of course, sure. those are all relevant spaces and, and we would encourage that to happen. Yeah, and it's good to have at least the info out there that the event existed and happened so that if other school libraries may be thinking about doing something similar, they could at least contact this place and say, so you did one and you're a similar type of library that, as us and you needed to close, tell me how you pulled it off. And they can exactly. Do yeah. Um, Chris, I think in in the chat that that only uh, uh, presenters see uh, the, through the, the way the software works. You mentioned a, a webmaster training MOOC. Would you want to uh, comment on that a little more? Yes, I just wanted to build off that. That um, we just finished a four week webmaker MOOC that was sort of basic training on WebMaker and basically the tools and the pedagogy and the practice behind it. But we actually are, I can't come, I can't come strong to the mic with a, a date per se, but th we are planning a version of that WebMaker training for librarians specifically um, and very much looking to, to work with uh, Mazbrarians. I can never say that right. Um, <laughs> uh, to Moslarians, there you go, to be co-constructors of, of that MOOC and co-facilitators, but that will be in the fall, probably in October is about as specific as I can get, and we will be doing a massive outreach. Um, the goal really is to get thousands of, of librarians into that participatory training program and literally hundreds of librarians looking to, to co-facilitate and design what that experience might be like. So. Um, that link that is on the screen share 
that I can send around or, or make sure it gets to your distribution channel um, that you can see the, the training as it exists now and the discussion threads so you can kind of get a sense. Um, and then we are definitely doing one for librarians. That will happen in the fall. Yeah, uh, uh, cool. if nothing else, I think I might be interested in attending. So, uh, yeah, please, <laughs> please keep us posted um, and, and send any links uh, possible. And another, I just want to jump in. Another sure. thing that um, you can do if you, you save your pennies, as I've done for the last two years, is go to attend the Mozilla Festival, um, in, which is held in London each around the same time, uh, around October each year. And I would really, I mean, there's already, that's where I met OK and um, some other librarians. There's already, you know, some librarians showing up. But, you know, there's, uh, that's like the best place also to immerse yourself in the world and the possibilities and the energy that is Mozilla. And you can propose sessions. And, um, you know, we as a library community can, you know, shape how that looks also. So I really uh, recommend going, and uh, you know, we just like shared an awesome Airbnb, and some of us were sleeping on the floor, and it was very fun. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had I've had that sort of experience before. Yeah, I've been <laughs> camping. <laughs> um, so I, I I'll, I'm going to ask like kind of a very open-ended question for all three of you, and and you've all kind of touched upon it, but. I'll just give a situation of, you know, okay, rural Nebraska, small library, staff of maybe one and a half people. This all sounds really cool. What should I do? How do I get started? Do I just declare myself a Mozillarian and, and, and off I go? Or, or what, what sort of advice would you give somebody in a really, really small rural library who, who just finds this stuff interesting but isn't sure what to do next? So, I, I mean, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so I think one of the things is to start uh, digging into the Maker Party page to, um, to uh, poke around the, also the web literacy tool and just try out a few things yourself. Um, there are some teaching kits and activities that you can remix. So I would you know, start getting familiar with it yourself pick something that might go along I mean, with uh, uh, ideas and programming you already have. I mean, that's, I think, some of the beauty of what Mozilla has is just like this huge range of resources that you can adapt to likely things you're already doing and thinking. Um, so there's, you know, getting to know it yourself. There's also finding out, you know, what other, uh, are there any Mozillans uh, in your community um, uh, who else might be interested in this in, in, other, in your small library network? Uh, also find out, like, who are the, I mean, I, I partly grew up in rural Saskatchewan, so I know what that looks like. And there was a lot of tinkering and makering, making going on in, like, you know, our shop on our farm. So that might be a really cool way also to connect with um, local makers and sort of create sort of a celebration of, of making. And finally, of course, the um, MOOC that uh, Chris mentioned. Um, I'm actually doing, there's a training that you can do that self-directed. So that's something I've started doing. And um, yeah, so those, um, Chris, you probably have a more coherent way <laughs> of laying this out. But those are some of the things that come to mind. And you know, connect with us and you know, send us an email. and you know, we can continue the conversation and, and give you some ideas. Yeah, I would say, well, we've got a, we've got a pretty vibrant Google Plus community, um, Mozilla Webmakers. Um, that is a good place to sort of be involved in a rolling conversation and share out. But we also have, while uh, there is self-directed training and there will be a training for librarians, the, the Webmaker instance of the conversation platform discourse is ongoing, so and it's just always on and, and has vibrant conversation on a daily basis. And so, what I'd say to people in the scenario that you that you laid out is that there really is vibrant community and then even sub communities that it's very easy to connect and start to collaborate very quickly. So, Moslarians, ooh, ding ding for me, um, mm -hmm. is already you know very specific community, and and I think 
joining that, and then that is already connected to the broader WebMaker community, and there's lots of places to have conversations, to share in both um, uh, in a digital format, and then, and then opportunities for that to manifest itself face-to-face -face once you start making those connections and seeing who's more, who's more regional. Um, also, I'll, I'll, that I can get, make sure that this information is on in your distribution list for following up, um, there, the, the National 4-H is a, a partner on Maker Party this year, and so um, we're helping 4-H clubs to do these Maker Parties, so it, to a perfect community and organization to partner with. So it might be, might be combining forces with other people in your town that have similar things and, and similar interests. Maker Parties are really strongest when they you know, if it's more than just some people sitting around a table, which we love as well, but if they're a little bit larger, even 10 people plus, they're always better when they have a couple different organizations or, or leaders or community members kind of coming together and sort of seeing how their interests, their mission, and their stuff cross-pollinate. So um, looking in, and contacting the local 4-H club might, might be a good start. Um, but those are, those are some immediate ideas about how to get started. And if you, on webmaker.org, there is, there is a full list of, of where to find, um, you know, how to connect and how to join various communities in conversation. Okay, did you want to add anything to that, or, or do you think they got it covered? <laughs> All right, um, we're we're running up towards our hour, but I'm I'm gonna attempt to make this go just a little bit long here. And I was wondering, Chris, specifically for you, if I gave you control back, is there any way you could give us like a three minute, which I realize might be asking much, uh, kind of uh, demo slash showing us popcorn maker? Because I got to be honest, that sounds really cool. Uh, sure, I'd be happy okay. to. All right, let me let me give you control back here. I realize showing video editing in a webinar is not exactly the easiest thing to do, but I, I just love to kind of take a look at it while while we got you here. <laughs> sure. Um, so if you, I just sort of, I'll just sort of walk you through. I was at, I click tools, and that gets you kind of the, to um, to the three tools I described quickly there. Um, so let's see. I'm gonna do. I'll start from scratch, and then I'll go back and show remix. A make. Um, so most of you probably have played around with iMovie or some other similar video editing software. So it has a very similar look and feel. I mean, you have your timeline approach, um, you've got your, your preview screen, and you've got your, your toolbar um, over onto the right. Um, but what's different about this um, is that you're actually, as you create, you're creating the video from web bits or web pieces. Um, and so as you can see, you can pull in media um, from YouTube, SoundCloud, um, Giphy, um, other those media sources, or if you even have um, you know web served HTML5 version of a piece of media that you made or something along those lines, you can pull that. But um, and you can start to pull that together. And then if you click on events, then you know you can pull. You have these editing features as well. So you can pull in 3D models. You can pull in stuff from Wikimedia. You can pull in stuff. Um, images that are on the web. You can pull in slideshows like from a Flickr stream or, or and, uh, and you can also annotate. So that's kind of the blank screen version. Um, and then once you publish, what happens is the video at the different timestamps, you've told the video to do a call out to the piece of web you want. It goes and finds that YouTube clip or that Flickr stream um, and makes a mashup of all of those web bits as when you told it to work and then how to do it. Now, so it, I'm going to do from Remix and Make, which starts to show how that um, happens a little bit. Oh, you know what? Um, that's, let me do – this might be a little bit embarrassing, but I'll show you one of mine. Um, so I have this thing that I like to call uh, popcorn mood rings. So this is something when I'm in a certain mood and I have a song that's in my head um, – that sort of is about that mood. I go on Giphy, which is just a clearinghouse of animated GIFs, um, and I take the song and I just grab it from YouTube, probably, and I delete out the video, um, or I just not delete it, but I just don't highlight it. So I use the audio track from YouTube and I collect GIFs to the song and mood, and then it has, usually helps me examine the different mood or feeling that I'm in. So if I hit remix on one of those. Um, I'm into the video editor, but what's nice is I can now build off somebody else. I, 
can't remember the song. I was obviously not, not in a great mood um, that day. Um, but if I hit play, you'll see that on layer two, all the different GIFs that I pulled. And what's nice about the remix is that you could just go in, click on that, and you could just swap those out. And so you can start to see how different people use it and, so, and, and use that template of someone else's project as a way to make your own. And so we really like this remix feature of all of our tools. It's really remix as conversation and as tutorial. Um, this is mine are not the most dynamic because I'm just pulling a YouTube clip, um, as you can see here on the right. You can see here I can I can have the video on, I can have the audio on or off, I can adjust the volume, I can say which seconds of the um, which seconds that I want of the video specifically. So I know that this has generally been not easy, but I will. It's only 30 seconds, so I'll kind of show one of these in action. So imagine, if you can't hear it, the isolated clip of recently departed Mary Clayton's background vocals on the Rolling Stones' Gimme Shelter, um, and then my, my the remixed animated GIFs with it. So the, basically, what's, every time it plays, this clip is grabbing that YouTube clip and his gift over top of it. So I'll stop it there, but you sort of get the point. And this is a very basic one that I made in like a couple minutes just to sort of um, kind of do a, a digital primal screen. And I do make happy popcorn, or popcorn mood rings as well. But that's a quick look. Um, it's really dynamic. It's a great way to introduce the ideas of APIs about how the web is constantly going and finding stuff on the web and bringing it into something else. Um, and it's a great kind of next iteration of what video on the web's potential can be. So you know, I, we, can, we can almost spend a whole other episode just on this. And, and Chris and I are sitting here going, that's so cool. Um, two quick questions for me. One quick question. Well, maybe quick question from the audience. Um, the two for me are, can you pull in your own content? And can you export your finished product? Or does it just kind of work in this environment? So you you so you can use your own content with the caveat that it has to be on the web. So if you've got a piece of video and you put it to YouTube or you put it to Vimeo um, or on SoundCloud if it's audio, then you then you draw it from that. So there's okay. a, there's an in between step. Or if you have your own web server and you put the HTML file, you know if you're a little bit more advanced, you could do those things as well. Sure. So of, yes, you could definitely use your own content. It just you have to keep in mind that you have to have it on the web to bring it into the tool. And then when you hit publish, um, then it gives you, in fact, this is what I start up. It gives you this. So you see Jennifer Lawrence there losing her mind in the diner. Um, and that is that, now it has to be in the browser, right? So it's, these are, this is browser-based video. Um, but it gives you this link with this kind of video player. And there's embed codes and stuff. Um, okay. And you could do a screen capture or something if you wanted to make it not online. But yes, you have a publish feature, and it gives you what you're looking at on the screen right now. Okay. And and the the last question we'll we'll do we'll, we'll wrap this up. But from the audience, and I suppose I should have thought of this too. Um, what are the copyright implications of what you're just showing us here? <laughs> well, general fair use. Um, General fair use covers all of this. I mean, this is okay. kind of using it in a, in a, a fair use generally protects mostly uh, remix culture, um, and these all come with Creative Commons licenses. So ah, perfect. Um, or you can place your own Creative Commons licenses on on work that you make. Right. Okay, I agree with you completely. I just think, well, you know, somebody asked, it's we want to state that for the record. Yeah. So <laughs> I totally understand, and it's always asked. You know, and, and that, you know, you're dealing with librarians, we're going to ask that question. So it usually comes up somehow. Um, so uh, I've, uh, this has been wonderful. I mean, I've, I've got all sorts of notes of things I want to go spend the next six days playing with. Um, do any of you uh, want, you know, uh, all your mics are turned on. Any last words before we uh, wrap up the show? No, I just wanted to... Thank you for, for inviting us and for allowing us to sort of publicly dig into and promote, you know, the Mosellarian concept. Mm -hmm. And I really encourage um, everyone who's 
listening to reach out and follow up and you know we'll be happy to share resources and links and give ideas about next steps. Mm -hmm. All yeah, right. Thanks for having us. Oh yeah, you're, you're very welcome. It's, this was great. Like I said, uh, yeah, both Krista and I are, are going to have some new toys to play with here <laughs> in, in the immediate future. Okay, so real quick here, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take back control for just a few more moments. Uh, show my screen. Clean. Oh, clean. Yeah, th this, this is, there we go. Um, you should be seeing yep. delicious. Okay, yeah, I just had everything minimized. Um, so, uh, as usual, we just do kind of a, a quick little newsy thing at the end here as we wrap up Tech Talk. I've really only got two things that I found recently that I, I thought I wanted to share. Uh, one here, and I will bring these up real quick is uh, the folks, uh, an author over at Ars Technica has written a 40,000 word article on the history of the Android operating system with screenshots from every single version back to versions you've never seen. And it's, I've started reading it, it's an amazing article. It's, it's one of those, you know, uh, too long didn't read, you know, you get back to it later. But um, I, I, it's a wonderful article if you're interested in the Android operating system at all. Um, and the other one, this was just, I, I was so amused by this when I discovered it yesterday, speaking of copyright, um, an artist, so you can't buy this, uh, took a copy of 1984 on uh, their Kindle and literally uh, photocopied the Kindle with all of the text on it and then put it together as a book. Because breaking the DRM to publish it would have been illegal, but photocopying it maybe or maybe wasn't. I don't know. I just, I was, I was completely amused by this. Uh, we pro will provide a link to this in the show notes. You can take a look. Uh, I almost want to buy one for myself in some weird and twisted sort of way. So that's all the uh, kind of only newsy items I have uh, and other uh, things to point you to. So that's going to wrap up Tech Talk. And so I will hand it back over to Krista to uh, wrap up uh, the show for today. Cool. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Michael. And um, thank you, Chris, Christine, and Oge. Got them all <laughs> um, for being on the show today. Um, that will wrap it up for this morning. Uh, we have recorded the show, so we're all good from there. I've got pretty much, I think, all the links into my delicious into our delicious account here, so you have that available afterwards as well. Um, I'll double check before we put the recording up. It'll be available sometime this afternoon, and we'll let everyone know. Um, so thank you for attending this morning, um, and I hope you join us next week when our topic is a very Nebraska-centric topic, of course, accreditation. Uh, getting accredited here in Nebraska. We've got some new accreditation that went in in the last year or two. And uh, Richard Miller from our library development office will be here to talk about um, that, what you need to do to get accredited, what you need to do if you're in the process of working on it. So please do sign up for that. And if you are on Facebook, and Compass Live is on Facebook as well, so please do go ahead, pop over there and like us. You'll get notifications of new when sessions are starting, when recordings are available. Um, we post things up on there so you keep up to speed on um, Encompass Live there if you are a big Facebook user. Other than that, that will wrap it up for today. Thank you very much for attending this week, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.